Next on Jonathan Bird's Blue World, Jonathan goes deep underground looking for a rare and elusive blind cavefish in the Yucatan. Hi, I'm Jonathan Bird, and welcome to my world. From the highest mountains to the depths of the ocean, life exists in nearly every environment on Earth. But some of these environments are surprising. Deep beneath the floor of this jungle lives a creature uniquely adapted for survival in a harsh, aquatic environment. To find it, I've traveled to the Riviera Maya in Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. The Yucatan is full of underwater cave systems. My quarry is the blind cavefish, an animal that lives in the complete and total darkness of caves for its entire life. To begin my quest, I head on over to Yucatec Divers in Playa del Carmen, where I meet Christine Lowe, who will be my guide to search for this exceptionally rare fish. We load the van in the early morning because we have a long drive to a remote cenote in the jungle. Our travels take us over rough dirt roads for miles. Finally, we arrive at the entrance to the cave, deep in the jungle. Christine is a cave diving instructor, someone who knows how to keep me out of trouble in a dangerous cave. We discuss our plan for the dive as we walk over to check out the entrance. It might not look like much, but this sliver of clear water leads into a vast cave system called Pet Cemetery. I really don't want to know why they call it that. Christine shows me on a map that we will only be seeing a tiny fraction of this massive system. Hopefully we can find the cave fish. And actually, you already see the line going around. It's, going, it's forming a loop and this is where we're heading. We will go counterclockwise because in that area very likely we are going to see the cave fish. I pay special attention to Christine's briefing. Diving in caves is serious business. Next it's time to suit up. Christine wears massive double tanks for cave diving so she has extra air just in case. This is cave diving protocol. We climb down a convenient set of steps and into the warm, clear water of the cenote, the name for the opening to an underwater cave system that flows deep beneath the jungle above. I grab my camera, do a few last checks, fire up my lights, and follow Christine into the darkness. Just inside the entrance, we're already surrounded by beautiful sculptures of rock. I'm always astonished by the incredible beauty of cave formations. During the last ice age, when sea levels were much lower, the water table was also lower. This cave was bone dry, but the constant dripping of water from the ceiling formed thousands of stalactites. They look like icicles and form nearly the same way, except out of calcium carbonate, a kind of soft stone. They're incredibly delicate. If I bump them, they will break and never grow back. Moving slowly and carefully is my responsibility. Christine and I use a special kind of kick called a frog kick. Instead of kicking our fins up and down like we do in the ocean, here we gently scull them out to the side. This keeps from disturbing the silty sediment on the floor of the cave. This fine sediment is easy to kick up and it will absolutely destroy the visibility. If we can't see, it's a lot harder to find our way out. 
Divers come here often, and these fish from the well-lit cenote outside have learned to follow divers' lights into the darkness to hunt in the cave. It definitely poses a threat to pristine and fragile cave ecosystems. With our little hitchhikers in tow, we finally reach the part of the cave where Christine has seen the cave fish before. Now she's carefully poking around, looking for one. Since I've never seen one, I'm not exactly sure what to look for. I'm surprised to see what looks like a bush growing in the pitch darkness of the cave. But it's actually the roots of a tree living in the jungle up above. The trees up there have no problem getting plenty of water. Christine is hunting in the tangled maze of roots. Sometimes the cave fish hide in there. I can't help but notice that there's air above my head. This cave actually has some very large air pockets. Since they're connected to the surface through tiny cracks, the air is safe to breathe. So I stick my head up and take a look around. There are more stalactites above water. Because these are in air, they're still growing. On the bottom, Christine points out some extremely thin and fragile flakes of calcium. This forms as a film on the surface of the water below dripping stalactites. When it gets thick enough, it sinks to the bottom. In some places, the flakes are stacked up several inches thick. This little pile is hundreds of years worth. As I continue looking for the cave fish, I stumble across a jawbone from some kind of animal that walked in here and died a long time ago when it was dry. This has to be thousands of years old, but it's in amazingly good condition. Skittering across the sand, I find a cave shrimp. This species is not blind, but moves between the dark and the light portions of the cave. It probably feeds on organic material that originates with the tree roots. Life is tough in the darkness. This is a catfish that couldn't find its way out. Christine searches for another mass of tree roots that might harbor a cave fish. When we find one, I start looking carefully in the roots. At last, I spot it, a pinkish white fish hiding in there. It's great to see, but impossible to film in that tangled mess. Fortunately for me, the fish shies away from light and swims out of the roots. Even though this species of fish has evolved for thousands of years in the complete absence of light and has no eyes, it can still detect the presence of light through its albino skin using a gland in its head. Why? This fish's only defense is darkness. If it wanders out of the dark part of the cave, other fish can see it, but it won't see them. The blind cavefish needs to stay in the dark where it's safe. My lights make the cavefish swim for cover and safety. The fish that follow me into the cave from outside take an interest in the cavefish. I have to shoo them away. In fact, in the cave ecosystem, this little fish is the top predator, the great white shark, if you will, of the cave. With our mission complete, it's time for Christine and I to turn around and head back out to the light. Christine knows this cave like the back of her hand, but for added safety, we follow a line. On the line are little plastic triangular arrows that point the way out. We could use these in complete darkness by feeling them and holding on to the line the whole way. Christine stops to point out an amazing type of stalactite. 
Unlike most stalactites, which look more like icicles, these unique formations look like elephant's feet with bulbs instead of points on the end. They're formed when the cave is partially filled with water and the stalactite grows from above, eventually reaching the water. Once the stalactite touches the water, it flattens out. As the water level changes, bulbs form at different levels. Finally, we're nearing the cenote entrance and we head back into the light. Christine explores the cenote just under the surface before we head back to the steps to get out of the water. Wow, that is such a beautiful cenote. Oh, all the formations hanging down and everything, that's great. It's hard to believe that there's an entire world living under the jungle in a submerged cave, but life survives everywhere in the blue world, even in complete darkness. <laughs>